All right, welcome to the first few folks that have hopped on the webinar so far. We are about to get started in a few minutes here. So uh, just hang tight. We're gonna give it a couple minutes so that folks can log on and then we'll get started. So thanks for joining to everybody that's on here so far. I see people flowing into the chat room. We got, let's see, almost 10 people on here so far. That's awesome. Uh, my co-host, Ellen, who's another one of the Artful Leads from 350 Seattle, just put some links into the chat. Uh, those are links to download the app Rush and download Dropbox if you would like. So if you haven't already downloaded the app, uh, I'd recommend using that link or you can go to your email. It should have been emailed to you as well. And that might be easier to access from your phone because you will need to download it to your phone to follow, follow along with this webinar. All right. See a lot of familiar faces in the participants list. Thanks for joining y'all. Thanks. Thanks to the old friends and the new friends for hopping on here. Um, if you just hopped on, I'm giving it just a couple more minutes for folks to trickle in before we get started. All right. Thanks for the question, Tina. So uh, if you haven't already downloaded the app Adobe Rush, that's what we're gonna be working with today. There are links in the chat that Ellen uh, put into the chat for either iPhone or Android, but you should have also received an email one hour ago that had those links as well. And it may be easier for you to go into the inbox for your email on your phone and download them uh, from the link that's in the inbox for your phone's email. That way it takes you straight to the App Store or the Google Play Store on your phone to download them. Sweet. And so, yeah, we have two ways to ask questions here. You can ask questions in the chat box, but it's actually easier for me if you use the Q&A feature, um, which should be on the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's an option to see the chat and then also an option for Q&A. Uh, the question and answer portion of this webinar will be during the last 20 minutes. So if you have questions as we go along, you can type them into the Q&A and I will address all of those at the last portion of the webinar. And looks like we got a good group of folks here so far. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just to let you all know, this webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out a link to the recording afterwards. So if things are moving kind of fast, um, you'll be able to rewatch this later. And I just saw Jim ask how long this webinar lasts. This webinar goes until 7 p.m. So it's only an hour. And like I said, it is being recorded. So you'll be able to watch it again later if you like. And we'll also be sending some follow-up info to you after the webinar in addition to the recorded link and all of that. All right, so we're gonna get started. What I'm gonna do here is share a screen so that we can watch some, uh, we can watch the tutorial and get into the webinar. So. Hi, my name is Austin and welcome to the first of 350 Seattle's Artful Activism webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about how to use the app Adobe Rush to edit videos from your phone. And before I get into the actual body of the course, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from occupied Coast Salish territory. Now, I know that uh, many of us are donating our money to organizations that are doing important work on the ground right now, but I encourage you to also go to the website realrentduwamish.org to learn about how you can support the Duwamish tribe as they still are not federally recognized by the United States government. Now, uh, once again, that website is realrentduwamish.org, so please visit it and find out how you can support. 
So uh, I'm just going to go into a brief overview of today. Uh, people should have already downloaded the app Adobe Rush, and you can also download the app Dropbox if you want to access some footage that we uh, have provided for you to test uh, this editing platform. So we're also adding those links into the chat box right now so that if you haven't downloaded them already, you can begin downloading those apps. And uh, I just wanted to say before we get into this, I'm going to talk about how awesome the app Adobe Rush is, but uh, this is in no way an endorsement of Adobe or an ad for Adobe. Uh, I looked at many different apps and platforms for editing on mobile devices and decided that this is the best option that we have right now, uh, given that it works on both Androids and iPhones uh, and has a lot of powerful tools. So. In addition to that, there's other reasons that we use Rush aside from just the powerful tools. It's a fast way to share videos on social media, which we're uh, realizing is very important in this current moment. Uh, in addition to that, it also has compatibility to your desktop computer, so you can start editing a video on your phone and finish it on your desktop. And uh, the purpose of the app is it's designed to edit videos quickly so that you can share them to different social media platforms. And we're going to get into all of that in more detail later. So uh, continuing with the overview of what we're doing today, uh, we're going to learn about the journalistic ethics of documenting this moment. Uh, unfortunately, that is a very complex topic that requires a lot of research, and I encourage you after this to continue educating yourself about uh, the ethics of documenting protests, especially uh, given the uh, protests that we are currently covering in the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, uh, the original purpose of this webinar was to uh, produce videos on the connection between the climate crisis and the COVID crisis. But as I've mentioned already, we're now adapting this webinar to address the current Black Lives Matter movement and how we can uh, both safely and ethically document this moment. Now, uh, we've seen the power of videos, the power of social media, and how the Black Lives Matter movement has grown just in two weeks and how it has mobilized people into the streets all over the world. And there's also a lot of issues with uh, sharing these videos on social media. So before I get into how to actually edit videos using Adobe Rush, we're going to just spend a little bit of time uh, covering the ethics of photojournalism in moments like these. Now, even if you're not a photojournalist, even if you're not a professional, even if you're just editing videos from your phone or shooting photos on your phone, uh, all of these topics can be applied to you. So getting into it, I'm going to share some slides right now. So this first slide, I'll uh, read the text for you. At the top, it says, Ferguson showed us that white photographers will walk away with Pulitzers and black activists will be targets of state violence. Now, this photo that we see in the middle is of Edward Crawford Jr. Uh, a police tear gas canister was fired into the crowd in Ferguson and he is seen here throwing it back at the police. Uh, tragically, Edward Crawford Jr. later died in 2017. Uh, this photo that was taken was actually taken by a photographer from a St. Louis newspaper who went on to want to win a Pulitzer Pulitzer Prize. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. A Pulitzer Prize for their work uh, covering Ferguson uprising. Now, uh, I just wanted to ground us in this context of Who is documenting this moment? Through whose gaze are we documenting this moment? And what impact do us as photographers and videographers have on the activists that are putting their lives on the line to do this work? Now, getting into this next slide, uh, this is a quote taken from the article put together by Authority Collective titled, Do No Harm, Photographing Police Brutality Protests. And this should be required reading for everyone that is interested in going to this, into the streets to support the Black Lives Matter movement. So this is a quote from photographer and filmmaker Ligaya Romero. Uh, quote, as photographers slash filmmakers, we need to ask ourselves, is this image surveillance from the bottom pointing up, holding power holders and oppressors accountable? Or are we furthering surveillance from the top pointing down, adding to the history of violence and surveillance of black, indigenous, and POC bodies, that's people of color, and creating a document that can be used to further that violence? So this is important for us to have in the back of our minds as we move forward with how we create images in this moment and who we're holding accountable or who we're jeopardizing by creating these images. 
Moving on to the next slide I'd like to share with you, which just has a couple more quotes from the Authority Collective article. So, quote, recognize that there is a history of photographing black people in ways that are used to subjugate and dehumanize them, adding to the justification of violence towards black people and communities. The constant circulation of images depicting violence on black bodies adds to the desensitization towards black suffering, while white bodies are photographed with dignity, subtlety, and nuance. It inflicts additional trauma on black communities with the deaths and torture of black and brown bodies are presented as a spectacle for social media viewing. And I think we can all understand the significance of that quote in the context of what has happened in the past couple weeks. Now, objectivity, this is another quote, objectivity is never more valuable than anyone's life and is impossible in questions over humanity, but it is still possible and necessary to tell truthful, honest stories without feigning neutrality. And that quote referring to objectivity, uh, objectivity is uh, praised in photojournalism. Uh, you're supposed to always document things with objectivity, but it's important to recognize that uh, we as image creators have power and that it's possible to actually harm those while we claim to be practicing objectivity. So there is more in the Authority Collective article that links to uh, the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics, uh, and you can go there and see the points on minimizing harm, which uh, apply to objectivity in documenting these. Now, all right. Thank you. I know that uh, some of you may not have expected to come here for that dive into ethics of photojournalism, but I think it's important to cover that, uh, even though I've covered it rather briefly. Now, moving forward, there's some simple things that we can do uh, in how we create these images that can protect identities. So. Uh, when you're out on the streets, uh, it's always beneficial to be filming the police, filming the cops, filming their behavior, filming their tactics. Uh, if they escalate a situation to film that, because that would be surveillance, holding those in power accountable, as opposed to surveillance, which would be uh, putting those protesters and activists in uh, positions that may jeopardize them. So there's other ways. I know it's important to document the crowds of people there, those who show up on the street to express their voice. And you can do this uh, through different photographic techniques, such as a wider composition. So instead of focusing on close-ups of faces, you can use wide compositions to show a large crowd, which makes it harder to identify individuals in the crowd. Uh, you can also focus uh, photographing the backs of heads of people. That way they're not uh, easy to identify. And you can also use close-ups that don't reveal identity, such as a raised fist in a crowd. But it's also important to be conscious of things that can be used to identify folks, such as uh, tattoos, uh, piercings, other body modifications. So please always be conscious of what is in your image that can be used to identify those people later. Um, the doc that has been linked here uh, already, uh, titled Ethics and Security in Protest Photography, uh, there's a lot of resources in this document on security tools, on uh, how to protect the identity of folks that are in your photographs. So please look into that, tool, uh, that document on ethics and security in protest photography, and it has information on uh, tools that you can use to blur people's faces, removing metadata from photos, which is the data that is attached to an image that says the date, time, location of when it was taken. So um, we don't have time in this webinar, unfortunately, to get into all the details of those, but there are lots of tools to uh, blur the faces and protect identities of people who you photograph. Now, let's see. Let's get into the body of the course. So, all right, and so before we get into the actual details of how you create the video within the app Adobe Rush, I just wanted to cover a few things about uh, video production. And it's important to always keep your story in mind even before you start editing or shooting. So you wanna think about who is your audience? Who are you trying to connect to with this video? What are you trying to tell to that audience? What are you trying to convey? Um, what is the goal of your video? Maybe you want to use to create a video to help advocate for the demands of organizers on a national level right now, which are to defund police and reinvest those resources in communities of color. Um, your videos should always be used to hold those in power accountable, not jeopardize those on the front lines. So it's important to consider your audience and your goal as you do that.
All right, so now we're gonna get into how to actually edit your video with the app. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is choose the clips that you're gonna use in your video. And what I like to do is to go into my camera roll and favorite the clips that I know that I'm gonna to want to use so that they're easier to find later. Now, once you've done that and you know what you wanna use, you need to come and open Adobe Premiere Rush. If this is the first time you're opening the app, you might see uh, something that says, watch this tutorial or watch this walkthrough. You can just close out of that because we're gonna go into more detail in this webinar. Uh, I already have a project created here, so you can ignore that. You'll probably see a blue symbol in the middle that says create project, or you can go to this plus sign down at the bottom, which is for create new project, and then you can hit add media, and you have all these different options for how you want to import the media or the assets for your project. I'm going to go to Dropbox, and you should have all received a Dropbox link, and if you have Dropbox downloaded on your phone, you'll be able to do this too, but you can also just go and import footage directly from your camera roll. Now I'm going to go down to this folder in Dropbox called webinar resources that I created, BLM protest footage, and I'm going to select every single one of these clips. And then uh, before I import them, on the in the lower half of the screen, there's a place for project name. I'm just gonna name it test and hit return. Then in the lower left-hand corner, you see it says sync with CC. This is for syncing with your Creative Cloud app, uh, Creative Cloud services if you have purchased those. Uh, you can leave this unchecked. And uh, I'm just gonna hit create. And it may take a while to prepare the media, so please be patient. Mine went pretty fast because I've actually imported a lot of this footage into the app before. So please be patient, it might take a minute and the more footage you select, the longer it'll take. All right, so now we're gonna go through an overview of the workspace and we're gonna start at the top and work our way down. But before I get into all the buttons, I just wanted to say that you'll probably be holding your phone vertically editing this way for most of the time. Uh, when you wanna play back or watch the footage, you can also rotate your phone horizontally into landscape mode for viewing, but you're gonna spend most of your time holding your phone like this. Now, at the very top, you can see there's a home button in the far uh, upper left corner. Next to that is the name of the sequence. Then you have three buttons in the upper right corner Order. You have the undo redo button. So if you make a change and then I'm just going to show you, you can hit undo. And if you hold it, then you have the option to redo that change. Uh, next to that is the export share button. And then after that is the send feedback button. But you're not really gonna use that button at all. Then in the middle, you have obviously uh, your feed for watching the footage and you have your timeline in the middle. In between those two are some buttons for playback. You have the play button, you have frame forward, frame backward, and buttons to go to the beginning or end of a clip. Uh, then at the bottom is really where all the powerful tools come in. So starting on the left of the bottom, you have this row of tools. Far left is a blue plus button, that's how you add photos, video, titles, media, voiceover, music, anything you wanna add, you're going to do so with that button. Um, let me reset this, there we go. So just to the left of that blue button is your project panel. If you hit that, you have all of your project assets. So you have your sequence and all of the footage and whatever, whatever else you've added. Uh, to the right of that, this is one of my favorite things about it, is timeline view. So this is the third button from the far left on the lower part of the uh, workspace. So I'm gonna hit that one more time for you. Now you have a basic timeline view like this. You hit it again and you have your advanced timeline view and this is what's really powerful is you can see you have different layers in here different uh, layers of audio and different layers of video and this is what makes it closer to a professional editing platform so we're gonna leave that as is in the advanced timeline view then to the right of that there's a reformat uh, button and this is how you choose your aspect ratio so mine defaulted to portrait mode or vertical because all my footage was shot that way you can also choose landscape mode or uh, what I recommend for many projects is choosing square. This is gonna work the best for most social media platforms. And also if you have some footage that was shot horizontally and some that was shot vertically, you can uh, crop them and reframe them to fit into the square so that they all match and look consistent. So that's really nice. Now, the next tools you have through here, uh, down here, I'm just gonna go through really quickly. You have your titles, transitions, color, speed for doing like slow-mo or speeding things up. Uh, audio, which is very important. We'll get into that later. The transform button. And just by the way, to scrub through these tools, you take your finger and just slide it along the lower part uh, to reveal the rest of the tools. Then 
after transform, you have those scissors. That's the cut button. Next to that is the duplicate button. Uh, next to that is a trash can. That's your delete button, obviously. And then beyond that, you have expand audio, and then you have change uh, selection tool. So uh, that's a basic overview of the workspace. I just wanted to go over one extra thing with this app that I really, really like. If you hit the blue plus button, one of the options is capture media. And this takes you into a camera within the app. And you have all these different tools down here. So I'm just gonna set something up really simple. So uh, you can choose your frame rate, you can choose your resolution, you can choose, uh, let's see, a bunch of other settings such as your ISO, your shutter, um, exposure bias, you can choose your temperature and your tent, um, how you focus, so you can actually control where the camera focuses with this. Uh, this is a really powerful tool. We're not gonna get into it too much, but I just wanted to let you all know that it's there and that this camera might be more powerful than the one that you have in your phone. So uh, now we're gonna get into the first steps of actually editing your project. So uh, we have this timeline here. I'm gonna make sure that I am in the advanced timeline so that I can see the layers of my project. Uh, one thing I like to do if you want to scrub all the way to the right over here so that you can see the tools on the far right, uh, you can expand the audio with the second to right tool in the lower part of the project window. Just click that again for you so you can see that again. All right, and so one of the first things we can do, I'm gonna go over here and select this clip. You can use your fingers to pinch and zoom in so you have more control. See those yellow bars or the orange handles on the sides? You can use those to uh, adjust the length of your clip and crop out parts that you don't want. Uh, you can also scrub through and use the cut tool, the scissors. So scrub to a part of the clip where you want it to begin. Okay, let's say, let's have it begin right there. I'm gonna hit the scissors, created a cut, then I'm gonna scrub to where I want it to end. Let's say I want it to end right there, and I'm gonna hit the scissors again. So now I have three clips. I'm gonna delete this first one by selecting it, hitting the trash can, then I'm gonna delete the third one by selecting it and hitting the trash can. Now all I'm left with is the clip that I wanted to, the parts of the clip that I wanted to use for my edit. Now, uh, here's one thing that's kind of strange and uh, takes some getting used to with this program. So your first level of the timeline here, the clips will magnetize to each other. They will stick to each other. So. What I like to do is move all of my clips up into these higher levels of the timeline. And you see now that I can set them anywhere in the timeline that I want. Uh, and trust me, you'll, you'll uh, figure out how this works through just experimenting with it. It can take some time. So don't get frustrated and just, just stick with it. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I have this long clip right here. This was a uh, clip of someone singing the uh, Black National Anthem at C Seattle City Hall. And I love the audio for it. I think it's really powerful. So I'm going to leave that as the base of my project and then add other clips on top of it. And so we can take this, drop it here. And then this uh, footage on top is what we'll see, but we'll hear the audio from both. Now, I only want to hear the audio from the main timeline. So you can see all these layers right here. I can mute individual layers. So I'm just gonna keep the bottom layer unmuted so that we just hear the audio of that singer. And then we can add in the other clips over that. So this is a pretty common technique for editing on any editing platform. Now, the next thing you could do is come through. Uh, I have music uh, from this clip from my phone that I'm gonna be using as the background music. You could add music if you wanted to. Uh, you could also adjust the audio levels on a clip by clip basis. So let's come here. What, let's see, um, I'm going to go through and select. So I have a clip selected. I'm gonna scrub down until I find my audio tool. I'm gonna to hit audio. And now I can control the audio on that individual clip. So we have the clip volume right here and I can scrub through. I'm gonna bring the audio down to about there. So we can just kind of hear it in the background. You can also choose to mute it. 
you can choose uh, what type of audio it is for organizational purposes. Uh, you can do auto volume uh, if you like, and you can also reset everything. So I, all I did on that is turn the volume down. Now let's go back. Next thing we want to talk about is the transform tool, which is just to the right of audio. So if I hit transform, I can choose the position, both uh, horizontally and vertically of the clip. I can choose how much I want it to rotate and I can choose the opacity, which is uh, how see-through it is. Now, I'm not going to use any of that in this project, but I just want you to know that you have those resources there if you like them. And then after that, let's just briefly touch on color for this clip. So if I hit color, which is between speed and transitions, now I have all these different presets. So I can choose cinematic, film, uh, then I can go through and choose the intensity of the preset. Uh, this is something that you're really going to have to play around with and find a look that you like, but it can lend another level of uh, expression to your film or your video if you create a consistent look throughout all of it. And you can also customize the presets and save them for future use. All right, so that was a basic look at some of the tools. Now I think what might be useful is if I just walk through how I actually uh, complete this edit and you can see some of the techniques I use to edit efficiently within this app. Now, as I said, I have this long clip right here that has the music track that I want to use also. And let's see, we can pinch to zoom out. Now I want this to be about a minute long so that I can share it on Instagram. So let's go right to here. And because I can view that waveform, I can see where I want to make my cut where the song tapers off. So I'm going to go over here to the scissors tool, make a cut, and then I'm going to delete that part that I don't want. And now I have the main video and audio track that's just a minute, and I can begin layering my footage over that as I want. Now, let's see. I know that I want these to be up here, so I'm going to move these around. As you can see, sometimes these clips uh, get attached to one another and it becomes difficult to move them. So don't become frustrated if you're having trouble moving things at first. It's just a matter of figuring out how this stuff is all connected. Uh, there's a purpose behind this. It's in theory, uh, having these clips magnetized to each other makes it easier. Uh, sometimes in practice, that's not the case, but uh, you can work through it. So just be patient. So what I did right there is I got all the clips uh, that I didn't want to be on the bottom timeline up on the higher parts of the timeline. I'm gonna zoom in again. I have this clip right here from a candlelight uh, vigil that was held the other night that I wanna use as the closing clip. So what I'm gonna do first is move this a little, little so I can scrub through it. Okay, I don't like that part where those people are walking away. So that's at the beginning of the clip, I'm gonna put the cursor, that blue arrow, where I want the clip to begin, hit cut, then delete that first part that I don't like. Now I just have the part of the clip that I wanna use. So I'm gonna zoom out and then I'm going to select that clip and drag it. This is what I mean when I say patience, there we go. Drag it over and place it at the end of that clip. So. Now I have the end of the song lined up with the candlelit vigil, which is nice. Now I'm going to go back to the beginning and look at this. So I've got all this awesome footage and I'm going to go through here and decide what parts I want to see. So we're going to open with that. That looks great. And then the camera kind of jitters right there. So I'm going to zoom in and say I want some other b-roll over that section. I'm going to move this here. You can use those orange handles to drag your clip to choose the place you want it to start. How about this right here? This looks nice. And now if I play it, you'll see that when it gets to that second layer it switches to a different clip. Awesome, people chanting, people cheering, and I'm gonna hit pause right there where I wanna make a cut. And uh, I had the top clip selected, so when I hit the scissors button, it only cut that top clip, that's really important. And then I have this other footage in this clip. Look at this, it zooms into the crowd and you can see all those hundreds and hundreds of people. So I definitely wanna use that. So I'm gonna hit cut where I want that to begin, go back and delete the part that I don't want, and 
when it zooms out, I want to cut there again. And now I can delete that last bit. So I have this other B-roll. These two are the same clip um, referring to the B-roll in that second layer of the timeline. So I'm going to move this one a little. Oops. That's what the undo button is for. If you make a mistake, you can always hit the undo button. As I mentioned earlier, if you hold the undo button, you have the undo and redo options. So you're going to be using that a lot. Trust me. And I'm going to zoom in. Hmm, it doesn't want to move for me now. Ah. For some reason, it's giving me trouble here. So. I want to move this and it's not moving. Why is it not moving? There we go. So I just had to click and hold for a little longer before I moved the clip. Uh, when you cut down your clips so that they're really small, sometimes, uh, you know, my fingers are a little bulky and it's hard to do the precise uh, actions that you want. So that's why the undo button's there and just be patient. Now, I'm going to hold that one again and bring it down here. I'm going to have it right around there. So we've got singing and then we got all that crowd right there cheering and beautiful. Now here's some footage from uh, Magnuson Park the other day, folks giving speeches. And then we have some footage of people marching. Let's put that further up the timeline. So hold. And then we got more footage of people marching. Let's layer that, or place that, excuse me, next to the other clip. And there we are. So those two can be right next to each other. Beautiful. And so now we got the beginning of the song, we got some additional B-roll of the crowd, more of the song, then we cut to people marching, and then we go to people marching at Magnuson, then we go to another shot of the crowd, back to the main song, and then a candlelit vigil. So this is just a rough, rough look at how you might organize things in here. Uh, some other useful tools are transitions. So if I have this B-roll right here of the crowd and I want it to fade back into the main footage of the song, I can hit this transition button right here and it gives me just three simple options. And you really don't need more than this for transitions. So you have none, which is just a hard cut, which is what I use most of the time. You have cross dissolve. Uh, dip to black and dip to white, which might be good for the beginning or end of the video, but would look a little weird in the middle. So I recommend you just stick to cross dissolve. And then as I scrub through, you can see that cross dissolve. See how it fades together right there? And that makes it a slightly smoother transition. So you may choose to use that in certain parts, but I uh, advise using it sparingly. You don't want to overuse it. Um, let's see. I don't have any slow-mo footage for this, so uh, sh changing speed is something I probably wouldn't do with any of this footage, but just so that you know, when you hit the speed button, uh, you get these uh, symbols, and it tells you you're playing this B-roll clip back at 100% right now, which is what I want. Uh, you can ch adjust the speed by going down here, speed range and you can slow it down and as you slow it down you see the clip expands it's now longer or you could speed it up and it becomes shorter so uh, that can be a fun tool to play around with maybe you're walking in a march and you film for five minutes straight and show how far you walk and then you speed it up and it looks like thousands of people are walking really fast so you know there's some cool tools to play around with there for this kind of stuff um, One other thing that might be nice to look into is titles. I personally am not going to use titles for this video, but I just want you to know that there's a lot of uh, presets in here. You can see all these options, uh, tons and tons of options, and you can customize them. So you can choose one of these and add the title. You click on it, and then you can type what you want in there. Uh, 
I personally am not going to use titles for these videos. That's totally up to you if you would like to do that. To delete a title, uh, you just click and hold on it and then hit delete. Now, let's see, this is a very just rough, dry cut. Uh, if I were to uh, have more time in this webinar, I would walk through exactly all the steps I would do to polishing this. Uh, it's a lot of back and forth. What I recommend is that, you know, you get things generally where you want them, then you watch the video from the start until the end and you go back and make changes. And you, uh, one thing that I like to keep in mind with editing is that a video edit is supposed to be like music for your eyes so there should be a rhythm and a pacing to it and the more footage you have to work with the uh, easier it is to create that sort of rhythm so uh, yeah you're going to want to make a rough cut uh, as i've done here i kind of have the rough outline of everything and then i go back and i watch it and i say oh that cut didn't feel right let me adjust that b-roll so that it's just a little bit earlier oh and b-roll by the way is just the additional footage so you have uh your main footage which in my case is this song and then the b-roll is the footage you put over that to add to it and uh tell a more complete story now, uh, once you've watched it a few times, you keep making adjustments and you can also, you know, ask for feedback from others on how they think it could, uh, could be improved because feedback from other folks is always valuable. Once you're ready, once you can go back into the upper right hand corner and hit the share slash export button, a screen will pop up that says ready to export. Exporting saves the video to your camera roll. You can choose the quality settings. Automatic is usually fine, but you can uh, make more adjustments there. Now, for those of you that are on the free version of this, you only get three exports with the free version. So, you know, use them sparingly. And then if you like uh, this app and decide that it's a useful tool for you to document this moment with, uh, then I encourage you to consider uh, the monthly subscription for this because it'll also give you access to the desktop version of this so you could uh, if you like you could start editing a photo on your phone and then complete the edit on your desktop and when i was talking about the at the very beginning the sync with cc button uh, that would be used when you have a desktop version of this and want your work on your phone to also be shared on your desktop computer so there's good reasons to be paying for this if you're going to use it long term you can also use it just to make three different videos for free so uh, don't export a video until you're totally sure that you really want to share it if you're using the free version um, and let's see also, uh, you may be sharing your video across different platforms. You might make a version for Facebook, a version for Instagram, a version for YouTube. And that's where one of these first buttons I talked about again comes in handy is this uh, format button where you can choose from landscape, portrait, or square uh, aspect ratios. Maybe you want the portrait mode to post on your Instagram stories, and then you want the landscape mode to post on your YouTube page. So you can uh, export a version, then reformat it for a different social media site if you like. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you joining us for this presentation, this webinar, uh, and I'm open to answering your questions now. So I know that this was kind of a rough look at this and that edits take a long time. So be patient with this stuff, take your time with it, don't rush it, that's the key. Uh, I know that the name is Rush, but I encourage you to take your time with it, especially while you're learning the app. So uh, as you get better at using the app, you'll be able to move more quickly through it and complete your projects faster. N learning new things like this always takes time. So just give yourself patience and ask for feedback from other folks before you share it so that when you click that export button, you know it's good to share. All right, now let's open it up questions. All right. Thank you, everybody. So um, I know that was a lot of information all at once. And I hope that some folks have questions. We have another 20 minutes left here. Um, as I mentioned repeatedly in that video, that was just a rough example of how you would begin to organize the footage in your timeline in the app Adobe Rush. So uh, if folks want to drop questions in the chat, uh, they're welcome to do so right now. And, um, and I'll be happy to answer those. So if anybody has questions, please go for it. 
And otherwise, I'm just going to, you know, stare at this empty screen until the end of this. So if, please don't be shy. I'm, I'm here to answer questions for whatever you might have. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention uh, while I'm waiting for any of y'all to type questions into that chat. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is you can also add music. Uh, I was using music that I recorded myself, but you can also uh, add music that you have downloaded to your phone. So uh, I know that I don't have that convenient uh, way to share the screen on my phone anymore, but if you do want to add music to your edit, uh, let's go back in here. So I have that edit here, that blue plus button. I didn't talk about this very extensively, so I just wanted to cover it one more time. When you hit that blue plus button in the lower left corner, um, that's where you'll have the option to hit add media, and then you'll be able to choose uh, what sort of you know photos, videos, et cetera. Albums is an option there, audio is an option there. And I see that someone is asking, can you use copyrighted music? So my understanding with that is the copyright issues apply to the platform on which you are sharing the video. So I know that YouTube is notorious for removing videos that have uh, copyrighted music by the Warner Music Group, which owns a whole bunch of stuff. I've had my own videos removed from YouTube for using copyrighted music from them before. Uh, Instagram, I have seen uh, some videos get removed for copyrighted music, but then I've also used copyrighted music on my own Instagram videos and they didn't get taken down. So it's kind of luck of the draw when it comes to copyrighted music. It might get taken down, it might not, depending on the platform and uh, what label or who has copyrighted that music. Um, so yeah, I know it's frustrating to have that uncertainty. You might put a bunch of work into an edit only to have it removed later from whatever platform you chose to share it on. Uh, if you're worried about that, YouTube actually has a music library of approved songs and it's huge. I use it for work with clients pretty frequently uh, when our projects are gonna be shared on YouTube. So I believe if you go to Google and just type in YouTube music library, there's uh, an extensive list of songs that you can download and use for your own projects. Uh, some of it's kind of cheap easy. Uh, it's like stock music some of the time, but then there's also some good stuff in there. So you got to kind of wade through it and find uh, what you're looking for, but you should be able to search by genre and things like that. Um, yeah. My advice with music is, uh, well, before I say that, I think music, picking music is the hardest part of getting started in the edit because the music has such a big impact on the feel, on the emotional impact of your project. So uh, what I like to do when I'm starting an edit and I'm uh, using a music track that was recorded by you know a professional artist, uh, I'll probably bring like two or three different tracks in and just layer my footage over each of them and just see how it feels and... Uh, finally pick the right one that fits the feeling I'm going for. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. All right. Ah, thank you. My co-host Ellen just mentioned that I was ignoring the Q&A box and was only checking the chat. So there are some questions in the Q&A. Uh, one from Tina. How much time would you spend creating and editing a short one minute video? Well, that is a great question and that answer really depends. Uh, you could spend uh, 15 to 20 minutes editing a one minute video if it's just I have clips one, two, and three and I need to put them in a different order and then export them. Or you could spend days on a one minute video. Uh, <laughs> that is totally up to you how much time you spend on it and how much of a perfectionist you want to be on it. Now let's see, I've got another question from Tina. What online tutorials besides this awesome one would you recommend? That, uh, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. There are a million tutorials out there. Uh, I recommend just going to YouTube and searching Adobe Rush tutorial. You might want more specifics, say, uh, if you want more information on about how to add and edit titles, you could type in Adobe Rush, how to add titles tutorial. And uh, YouTube, I've learned more about editing on YouTube than I learned in four years of uh, film school. So yeah, YouTube is the place to go. Now I've got another question from Caitlin. Uh, oh, let's see. 
Caitlin just mentioned in response to Tina's question that you can also access lynda.com courses through the library. So yeah, lynda.com I have not used before, but I understand it's a good resource, resource for all sorts of different educational courses. So thank you, Caitlin. That's a great resource. Uh, another question from Caitlin. Uh, oh, just one more point from John Michael. Thanks for joining us, John Michael. Uh, Skillshare.com also has excellent resources. That's a great point. All right, question from Caitlin. Joined late, so you may have covered this, but what about compressing videos to make them more shareable? My problem with videos is they always end up being too huge for me to share easily. That is a really good question. Uh, my understanding with this app is that since it's designed to quickly share videos for social media platforms, that when you hit export and there's those auto settings, that it's automatically compressing them. So uh, you may have to experiment with this depending on the footage you're using. Maybe you're importing footage from a professional camera that has a higher uh, amount of data, a higher file size that needs to be more heavily compressed. Uh, if you're just doing stuff from your phone, I imagine that the auto compression when you hit export will work just fine. But once again, that's something you're probably going to have to experiment with. Um, Jim, with the free version, can you save the edited project without exporting it? Unfortunately, I, well, the edited projects are saved within the app. That's my understanding. So uh, they're automatically saved in there. Um, when you close the app, you should be able to just reopen it and start editing again. Um, it's just a matter if you want to share those projects on different platforms that you have to hit export. So yeah, um, they should be saved in there in the free version though, and you should be able to come back and work on them as much as possible until you hit export. Then we've got a question from Chacho. Speaking of adding music, would you recommend adding music as the bass layer? Yes, so that's a good question. When you just have a music track in there, uh, I do not believe, I actually haven't experimented with this too much, but I believe that the music track uh, won't function the same way as the bass layer that I was discussing in my tutorial. So because I had a video and audio clip that was functioning as my bass layer, it was easier for me to add B-roll where I wanted in the tracks above it. I think if you just add a music track that your clips won't, uh, that it won't function the same way and that I was able to move my B-roll around as freely as I wanted without it magnetizing or sticking together. I know it's kind of a messy answer, but uh, Chacho, I trust that you're savvy enough to figure it out. And so you can report back to me once you figure that one out. Um, but yeah, this is actually a new app for me as well. I've only been using it for a few weeks now. And so I appreciate y'all joining me for this. And there, I'm still, every time I make an edit with this thing, I learn something new. So there's, uh, I've been using the app iMovie on my phone to edit videos for a long time. And it was very limited in what you could do. And that's why we chose this is because it has so much, so many resources, tools, and features that you can use that even after, you know, several weeks of using it, I'm still discovering new, new things. So I just encourage you to keep playing around with it and you may find something that I didn't know beforehand. So, um, Chacho, you can report back to me on that one once you've made your next video. All right. Um, wonderful. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Do, do any other folks have questions for me right now? I appreciate you all joining. This is awesome. Uh, for those of you that may have joined a little late, this is the first of 350 Seattle's Artful Activism webinar series. So uh, I'm one of the Artful team leads and we have other members of the Artful Activism team that are gonna be putting on other webinars in the future. So if you're not already on 350 Seattle's emailing list, you should get up our, get on our email list by going to our website, 350seattle.org, and then you won't miss other webinars in the future on awesome stuff like this. Um, we've still got 10 minutes, so I'm here to answer questions for all of you. Let's see. Are there effects to change the video into something like a cartoon? Well, that uh, is something I had never considered before. Are there effects to change the video into something like a cartoon? Well. If you really wanted to create like a full cartoon effect, I do not think that this uh, app is capable of creating 
uh, animations from scratch, basically. So that might be a bit of a stretch for the processing power of this app. But one thing that you can do if you want to create kind of surreal effects with the footage that you're working with is go to color. You're not really going to be able to see this very well, but in the color tab, uh, there's all these different presets you can choose from. And you go to the bottom after you choose your preset and there's these different tools down here to change uh, intensity, exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, temperature, vibrance, saturation. If you just start pushing those to the extreme, you're going to get kind of a cartoonish effect to your videos and that it might be really oversaturated, really contrasty, really bright, vibrant colors. So that's probably the closest I could think of as far as creating a uh, a cartoon effect with your video, but I have a feeling that's probably not what you were going for, but that's the, the most I can offer at this point. Um, animation requires a lot of processing power. Uh, you, most people are generally doing animations on desktop or laptop computers that have a lot more power than uh, just an app on your phone would. So I'm also not an animator, so I'm not really the one to ask about that, but that's that's kind of the extent of my knowledge right now. And yes, uh, Ellen, my co-host, just dropped in the chat box a link to sign up for future Artful Activism emails. So if you're curious about uh, more of our webinars in the future or getting involved with uh, the Artful Activism team at 350 Seattle, you can follow that link in the chat that Ellen just added and we'll stay in the loop and keep you involved with more projects in the future. Uh, I imagine that most of the folks in here already know this, but 350 Seattle is an organization focused on advocating for climate justice in the Seattle area and the greater Pacific Northwest region. Um, Art is a huge part of every movement, whether it's photos or videos, but then we also, on the Artful Activism team, uh, do skill shares for songwriting and banner making and street murals and all sorts of awesome stuff. So this isn't limited to photo or video people. Uh, our Artful team is full of people of all talents and skills, and we need all those skills to build a strong movement. So uh, whether you're professional photographer or you know you just like drawing and doodling uh, we've got a spot for you on the artful team and we would love to have you and i uh i'm not used to this most zoom calls i have a back and forth conversation with folks i feel like i'm just talking to myself for hours here but um uh, you know that's cool too so uh yes and ellen mentioned that artful activism is also fun so that's important to remember we have a good time while we're doing this work and you build lots of connections with really awesome people i've become really good friends with all the folks on the artful team and i wouldn't trade those friendships for the world so i encourage you to stay involved and stay in communication with us because we'd love to have you more involved and for those of you i know a few of my friends that are on this right now are quarantining because of risk of exposure to coronavirus and we uh, that's why we're doing these webinars is so that those of us that are quarantining and self-isolating and uh, practicing those health measures still can participate in the movement from home via these webinars I see Elizabeth just said I got stuck right up front as I was unable to download rush well Elizabeth um, that's okay. I figured that some folks would have technical difficulties on this and that's why this web entire webinar has been recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording after this ends. So even if you weren't able to download at the very beginning or if you got tripped up along the way and something happened and you weren't able to keep up, that's okay because you'll be able to go back and watch all of this at your own pace and uh, rewatch it as many times as you need to. And yeah, wonderful. Let's see. I'm just checking the chat. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. Awesome. I hope I was able to answer those questions. I know that I didn't have perfect answers for all of them. Just tried to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, I guess it's important to keep in mind that this app, uh, while it's the most powerful video editing app for mobile devices that I've found, it does have limitations just like any app would on your phone. So, uh, 
I hope that y'all are able to utilize it and utilize it uh, to whether document the current moment that we're experiencing and uh, the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, or maybe you will join us in the future and use it to document uh, the climate justice movement, which as we all know is tied to uh, racial justice and social justice because uh, all of these things are interconnected. So whether you're here for the climate justice space or to here to learn about how to document the current uh, growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, I hope that you will use the, what we've discussed today as a uh, starting point for how to safely document these movements. Um, for those of you that joined late, I spent the first about 10 minutes of this webinar talking about the ethics and uh, security issues regarding photographing and video videotaping protests. Um, I'm going to copy that link to a document I created on security issues and ethics issues in protest photography and repaste it in the chat so that if folks are interested in learning more about the ethics of uh, photographing these movements, they can start there and that's a good resource for starting. And yes, I see Mustafa just mentioned, uh, we could still use iMovie for simple video edits and save the three exports for complicated ones. That is an excellent point. iMovie is free, uh, but it is limited to iPhone users. Part of the reason we chose to use Adobe Rush is because we know many people are on Android devices and uh, Android and iPhone, Adobe Rush is the same on both of them. Um, but yes, that's a great point. If you just have really, really simple edits to do, you can download an app like iMovie and just do the simple edits in there and then you'll be able to export as many as you want. Uh, and then if you need to do more complicated things, you can come into Adobe Rush for that. But uh, not gonna lie, in my experience, once I started using Adobe Rush, I didn't want to go back to iMovie because there were so many limitations in it. So kind of got to pick your battle there. I see that Tina just signed up for the email list. So welcome, Tina. Thanks for joining the Artful Crew. And yeah, this has been lovely. I appreciate you all joining us for this. There's just a few minutes left. So I just want to open it up to any remaining questions that folks might have. This is also the first webinar I've ever done, so I appreciate y'all's patience as I kind of stumbled through this. I'm not used to talking to an empty screen, but I hope that I was able to communicate this stuff in a way that was uh, easy enough to understand. So thanks everybody. And yeah, um, I hope to see you in the streets. And if I don't see you in the streets, uh, I hope to see you in person very soon and that we can continue building as uh, artists and activists together and working towards a better future. Beautiful. Thanks y'all. I appreciate the, the words of encouragement and the positive feedback. I, I really do. It means a lot. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, let's see, just as a reminder, we got two minutes left. This is all being recorded. So you'll be able to watch this back as many times as you need to. And um, yeah, I think that's all folks. So thank you everybody for attending and for joining us. This, is, uh, this was a learning experience for me and I hope it was a learning experience for all of you. So thanks everybody. Beautiful. It was good to see some friends in here too. Shout out Chacho, shout out John Michael. I know I told you guys about this like 30 minutes before it started. So thanks for hopping on and joining us. Beautiful. And I am going to end the webinar because I think we've covered everything. So thank you everybody. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay vigilant, stay active, and I'll see you soon.